and welcome to the Sneaker for Alliance's third lecture in a series about the nuclear fuel chain. My name is Ava Traverso, Energy Program Manager for the Snake River Alliance, and I will be your host tonight. Also with me tonight is Lee Ford, the Executive Director of the Snake River Alliance, who will be helping during question time and with the chat. First, I wanna take care of a couple of housekeeping items. If you submitted a question via email, we will compile similar questions in the interest of time. If you would like to ask a question after the talk, you may use the raise hand function or write your, write your question in chat. If you would like to verbally ask your question, please keep it to under a minute so everyone has a chance to speak. Once everyone has had a chance and there's time remaining, feel free to ask another question. I'll start with why we want to explore the entire nuclear fuel chain. There has been a lot of buzz around new nuclear being carbon free, clean, and safe. While no carbon is produced when the atom splits, it does not tell the full story. Without further ado, I am excited to welcome our presenter for the evening, Kevin Camps. Kevin works with Beyond Nuclear and lives in Tacoma Park, Maryland. He has extensive knowledge about radioactive waste generation and storage risks at reactor sites and transportation through communities across the country. Before joining Beyond Nuclear, Kevin was the radioactive waste specialist for Nuclear Information and Resource Service. Kevin has also traveled to Chernobyl in Ukraine and founded a Michigan chapter of the Inter International Chernobyl Children's Project, which brings child victims of the Chernobyl incident to the United States for medical help. He has also worked with radiation victims in the US and Canada, including those living near uranium mines and downwind from the Nevada nuclear weapons test site. Thank you for joining us tonight, Kevin. Thank you so much, Ava and Lee. And um, as we discovered in our practice session, I may have some connectivity issues. And so I may go off video to uh, try to strengthen. Okay, can you all see it? Yes, sir. Very good. Very good. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much to Snake River Alliance. And thank you all for being here. The title is Mobile Chernobyl, which is a phrase that was coined by Michael Marriott of Nears some quarter century ago. And the context is uh, the Yucca Mountain Permanent Geologic Repository in Nevada on Western Shoshone land. And that became really the slogan of the resistance across the country because of the transportation risks. And it became one of the biggest tools that the resistance had in fighting Yucca Mountain. A related slogan was, uh, when it comes to nuclear waste transportation, we all live in Nevada. So the subtitle, Preventing Unnecessary Risks of Transporting Highly Radioactive Waste. And this is really gonna focus a lot on bad repository sites like Yucca Mountain, but also consolidated interim storage facilities, which are non-starters on their face. And we'll talk some more about that. Okay. So I just wanted to show this image because uh, there's actually a targeted high-level radioactive waste transportation route that comes this close to the U.S. Capitol. And a colleague, Rick Hind at Greenpeace International, um, granted the context was toxic chlorine trains going through this very route. But he escorted a Wall Street Journal reporter into the tunnels and the trains too that are covered in graffiti, which back 20 years ago, showed that these tunnels, this route is wide open to anybody in, in that case. Oh, Kevin, I think you went silent. Can you try to take off your video? Sorry for the interruption. And the same is true of high level radioactive waste. This is where about two thirds or even more up to 70% of the high level radioactive waste of the commercial industry is still stored in these indoor wet storage pools, these giant deep pools of water. And I'll just point out that a part of the reason for the clarity, this is a very deep pool. This is 40 feet deep. These uh, fuel assemblies are 12 to 14 feet tall. So that means there's tens of feet down to them, but you can see them so clearly and it's because the water is filtered extensively to get impurities out of there to prevent corrosion of the metal on these fuel assemblies because any corrosion is gonna become problematic and worsen over time. And 
The fuel assemblies themselves, the thin metal cladding, is given credit for one of the containment layers of high-level radioactive waste. But another part of the pool water is that it is thermal cooling for this hellishly hot, thermally hot waste, but it's also very significantly radiation shielding for the workers especially. Um, that tens of feet of water are providing radiation shielding. The workers are still being exposed to gamma and perhaps also neutron radiation as they work on the top of the pool. But if the water was not there, it, these would be fatal doses given that much weight, waste and depending on how long it had been out of the reactor core, uh, you could get a fatal dose literally within seconds being that close to it. And I seem to have some delay in my slide advance for some reason. Um, this is another configuration for high level radioactive waste storage at nuclear power plants. It's really for the overflow because the pools in the United States, almost to a pool now, are packed as densely as possible. And so to keep a reactor operating, to put the hot waste coming out of the core into the pool for several years of required thermal cooling, the uh, oldest waste ideally would come out of the pool and go into dry cast storage. And this is a NRC graphic showing a horizontal orientation inside what they call a bunker, but really there should be little to no security credit given for this configuration. This is another configuration, it's vertical in orientation. Again, if there actually was a person and workers and inspectors and NRC staff, sometimes public tours will come this close to high level radioactive waste dry cast storage as it's called. And um, you are getting a dose. What the regulations allow is 10 millirem per hour at a distance of two meters, which is 6.6 .6 feet. The same is true of transportation containers. One problem is in a dry cask storage array, and I'll show you here a real one at Big Rock Point in Northern Michigan, you have multiple containers. And so you're getting gamma and neutron from multiple containers at the same time. So they allow for 10 millirem per hour coming off of the surface of each cask at a distance of about six feet away. But if you get right up to the cask surface, the allowable emissions go up to 200 millirem per hour. That's a 20 fold increase. And to give folks an idea of how much this is, a typical chest x ray is around five um, millirem. So you're getting five to 10 millirem. You're getting one to two chest x rays per hour at a distance of 6.6 .6 feet away from these containers. And the other thing I want to say about this slide. It shows a cross section. Those layers serve different purposes. So there's structural um, characteristics to dry cast storage, but there's also radiation shielding again. This time they're dry casks, there's no water to provide radiation shielding, but different layers of dense materials, neutron absorbing materials, sometimes lead and other radiation absorbing materials shield people that get close to these things to prevent the, the fatal dose that I mentioned earlier in a short period of time. And that radiation shielding has to be maintained at all times. And that's a real challenge during transportation, especially if accidents or attacks take place. Um, so this is, like I said, Big Rock Point nuclear power plant in Northern Michigan. Fortunately, it closed in 1997 after 35 years of operations. It was a tiny reactor. 1200 megawatts electric. This was a tiny reactor and that's why even after 35 years of operations, there are only seven containers of irradiated nuclear fuel or high level radioactive waste and one container of highly radioactive greater than class C so-called low level radioactive waste. But as you'll see in the next slide, if you could go on, um, can you go yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, this is an artist's rendition of what is proposed in West Texas at Waste Control Specialists, which is already a national so-called low-level radioactive waste dump serving three dozen states. They want to now move into high-level radioactive waste, what they call interim storage. It's supposedly a private facility, although the company Interim Storage Partners 
uh, which is a consortium of waste control specialists and Orano of France, formerly called Arriva, and some others like uh, NAC, Nuclear Assurance Corporation, who is a cask vendor. That is the Interim Storage Partners Partnership. And you can see um, this is a bigger facility than Big Rock Point. In fact, what they've applied for here is up to 40,000 metric tons. There's only like 400, I believe, metric tons, if I'm not mistaken, not even that, more like 50 at Big Rock Point. This would consolidate or centralize uh, a good chunk. There's about 90,000 metric tons. It's growing by 2,000 metric tons per year across the country. These are commercial industry figures. And this facility would be 40,000 metric tons, so just under half. And you can see it's a, a hodgepodge, I guess, of different cask designs, some in the vertical orientation, some in the horizontal orientation. And it's in extreme West Texas where they want to do this above the Oglala Aquifer. Next slide. Yeah, now this is a sibling facility, Holtec International and Eddie Lee Energy Alliance another supposedly private consolidated interim storage facility in southeastern New Mexico, just 40 some miles to the west of the Texas site. So this is an effort by industry and its friends in government to really turn this area into a high level radioactive waste sacrifice zone. And where Texas is um, looking at up to 40,000 metric tons, New Mexico's proposal is at least 100,000 metric tons and if you believe whole text documents, it could be as much as 173,000 metric tons. And again, there's at this point 90,000 metric tons in the US. So whole text facility would accommodate everything, if not double. And just by comparison, um, the Yucca Mountain proposal in Nevada on Western Shoshone land was a grand total proposed 70,000 metric tons of waste burial. 63,000 metric tons would have been commercial, 7,000. DOE complex. So nuclear power in the United States going out decades or even centuries. Are they planning to bring in other countries' wastes? Are they planning to bring in military wastes? Uh, next slide. Oh, before we move on, I should say, you'll notice this is a pretty different configuration. This is subgrade, but it's not really below ground. It's not below the natural land surface. What they would do is build an artificial platform of various substances and the pits that they would lower the inner canister holding the waste would be drilled down into this artificial platform. So it's not below ground, although they would like to claim that it is. And originally it was a seismic design up at Humboldt Bay, California. They have a prototype that's somewhat different, but it was their first step in this kind of design. But these days, instead of claiming it as just a seismic design, after 9-11, Holtec tried to claim that this was a security design, but there's actually real questions about the security of this design. Next slide. So another uh, consent-based siting initiative, so-called at the Department of Energy, um, another version of consolidated interim storage facilities only this time not private, but federal, explicitly federal. Whereas the private ones, truth be told, it's hard to tell the difference because both of those private companies are looking to the Department of Energy to pay all the costs and bear all the burdens and hold the liability and even the title perhaps in the nearer term. So there's a real blurring of the lines between, between federal and private. And then this catchphrase that the DOE likes to bandy about, consent-based siting. And they just announced after more than a year of putting the proposal out, they just announced the awards of $2 million each to 13 different consortia that applied for this money to pursue consent-based siting, or at least to advance the idea, to promote it, to explore it, to define it. And ironically enough, one of the team leads for one of the consortia is none other than Holtec International itself. And the irony is that if anyone should understand what non-consent means, it should be Holtec because the state of New Mexico, as with the state of Texas regarding interim storage partners, have strongly and loudly expressed their non-consent to being the host states for many years now. And so it's very ironic that 
that Holtec is a team lead exploring consent-based siting, but maybe they'll learn something in the process about what consent means. Uh, next slide. So why have I talked about uh, Yucca Mountain, Nevada? Why have I talked about consent, I'm sorry, uh, consolidated interim storage facilities? Well, there's no magic wand to simply teleport the wastes from where they are at, which are indicated here. The radiation symbols indicate uh, nuclear power plants in this country to where they would go. Um, in this, look at where the nuclear power plants are with their high level radioactive waste and came up with these most likely rail routes to get the waste to interim storage partners in extreme West Texas, right on the New Mexico line. And what's so valuable about this map is that the companies, both interim storage partners and Holtec in New Mexico have tried their darndest to not really reveal the routes. I think the industry and even government agencies, some of them um, who are proponents of these schemes have tried really hard in the aftermath of Yucca Mountain to keep this issue quiet, to keep routes as secretive as possible. And I'll, I'll show you what map show what the most likely rail routes are. And it was just a godsend. And our challenge now, as with Yucca Mountain in Nevada, is to try to educate the communities along these routes as to what's coming. And as we saw from East Palestine, Ohio, I mean, Nears uh, has had a great slogan again over the years when a big train wreck happens. And there was just another one in Yellowstone River the other day, right? They would ask the question, what if high level radioactive waste had been on board? And so at East Palestine, um, the country's attention was riveted for not days, but weeks. The National Transportation Safety Board just in recent days held a two day hearing in East Palestine, still examining, investigating the devilish details of this horrendous environmental disaster. Um, five train car loads of vinyl chloride intentionally burned, incinerated into the environment in order to supposedly avoid a large scale explosion. Only now it appears that that fear of an explosion may have been wrong. And so that incineration disaster may have been avoidable. But the, one of the headlines from the, the two day hearing was the fire chief locally who testified that the company, Norfolk Southern, gave him 13 minutes to decide what to do about this incineration proposal. And uh, he said he didn't feel real good about that. And um, I guess now, you know, the investigation will maybe get to the, the root of some of, of the bad decisions that got made. But anyway, um, here's this map and I'd like to move to the next slide and show you what was included in the interim storage partners application. And Kevin, you cut out a little bit during this slide. Um, you might okay. want to try turning off your video. I'm sorry for interrupting. Um, yeah, I did turn off my video already. Oh, gosh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Trying. That's okay. Technical difficulties. Yeah. Um, could you move on to the next slide, Lee? So this, um, yeah, and certainly if I cut out, let me know. Um, this is a map showing all the mainline rail in the country, including Norfolk Southern in Eastern Ohio, by the way. This is interim storage partners pretty much admitting that any mainline rail in the country could be used. So I'll give them credit for that, but it's not specific. So again, we're playing this game of hide the ball. But, you know, we, we try to point out to communities that, well, they've admitted that they may come through your area with high level radioactive waste. So you need to take this very seriously. Uh, the next slide is another map that was almost identical in the Holtec application as well just the destination moved a millimeter, literally on the page across the New Mexico line. The colors were the same, the logo was changed. Somebody plagiarized somebody else. But um, it only accounts for four reactors, one at Maine Yankee and three at San Onofre, California. So what about the other uh, 125 reactors in the country? They are not accounted for on this map, but this does give a little bit more specificity so at Maine, you've got 60 containers of high level radioactive waste that would be shipped along that blue line through about a dozen states to West Texas. From San Onofre, passing through four states to get there, you've got a, a lot more waste because it's three reactors, including two of a pretty large size. 
And um, the rest of the country, as that previous map showed, would take different routes to get there. And then what the green represents uh, in interim storage partners and Holtex plans, <laughs> incredibly enough, they are assuming that Yucca Mountain, Nevada will be the permanent repository, which is a bogus assumption because it's off the table. It's not happening. The state of Nevada does not consent. The Western Shoshone do not consent. And a thousand plus environmental groups across the country have joined the effort over the past 40 years now to block that dump. So this is a bogus assumption, but it's a part of that non-starter nonsense of consolidated interim storage. Given the transportation risks, um, you are automatically doubling the transportation risks because you're going to a temporary site and then someday it's going to have to leave and go to a permanent repository, supposedly. And we don't know where, but it's not going to be Yucca Mountain, Nevada. But they, they use that assumption. NRC licensed the Texas dump in September of 2021, licensed Holtec in New Mexico in May of 2023, based on this bogus assumption, which is outrageous because NRC is supposed to be the licensing agency on Yucca Mountain. So I guess they've already made up their mind even before the proceeding was held. But you can see um, that a city like uh, Fort Worth, Texas is gonna get hit coming and going. They're gonna get hit by the main Yankee waste coming out to West Texas. And that very same waste will pass through Fort Worth again. And it's helpful because the color coding shows the, the number of shipments coming through various states. But again, this is Yucca in context. So you can see that Nevada and Utah were hardest hit. But some other states like Indiana, for example, with no reactors within its borders, would still be a transshipment route for 6,300 uh, shipments from other states moving west to go to Yucca Mountain, Nevada. So that's true of these consolidated interim storage facilities as well. And that's the kind of detail we're hoping to educate communities about so they can take action. Next slide. I guess on those transport maps, I'd like to just mention too that if you notice, 90% of the nuclear power plants, which means also 90% of the waste is in the eastern half of the country. And 75% is east of the Mississippi River. But of course, the dump site targets are all in the west. So it's a real issue of regional inequity as well. And this is just that repository, um, pun intended, of just cutting edge scholarship by the State of Nevada Agency for Nuclear Projects. Again, we were talking about it during the practice session, um, so-called progress. They've unfortunately updated their website. And uh, so I have to use the Wayback Machine to get back to this repository that I'm so familiar with from using it for so many decades. Next slide. This is another um, part of Dilger's study from 2017. Again, this is in the context of Yucca, but it does capture the number of shipments for a state like Idaho, uh, 2001 rail casks, four truck casks uh, for a grand total of 2005. And the thing about rail casks is they're much larger in size. So the truck casks refer to legal weight truck shipments going down the interstate highway. Each of those can hold at most four pressurized water reactor fuel assemblies. But by contrast, um, 20 years ago, the rail casks could hold up to 24, six times more. They're much bigger. But these days, Holtec, for example, has a cask called a UMAX rail-sized cask that can hold 37 pressurized water reactor fuel assemblies, almost a tenfold increase in capacity compared to legal weight trucks and a 50% increase in just the past 20 years. So they're trying to maximize capacity to improve efficiency, as they say, which means maximize profits, but there is a mother load of radioactivity in these gigantic rail sized casks. Next slide. Another helpful thing um, from Fred Dilger's 2017 study was that it identified the congressional districts that these either truck or train or even barge routes were passing through. And in Idaho's case, the second district um, was um, passed through by these shipments. 
And uh, this was a 2017 study, so it would have to be updated. There have been changes to the congressional districts, of course, changes to the members representing them. But this gives you an idea of uh, the educational power of studies like this in terms of educating members of Congress. Um, you can see that Illinois, most of the state's congressional districts, if you go to the next slide, um, are crisscrossed by um, these proposed shipments to Yucca Mountain in this case. But the further east you get or the further west you get in this country, the routing is gonna be identical or very similar to Yucca's because these are the origins of the shipments, the first legs. So whether they're going to Nevada or Texas or New Mexico, at least initially, um, those originating shipments will travel the same routes. And eventually there will be differences depending on the destination. Next slide. So again, here's a cutaway, an artist's rendition showing the various layers that play different roles. But these are the layers that will be tested by a severe accident or a terrorist attack. Um, and if you lose certain layers, you have introduced um, tremendous risks, not only to the local area, but even to a broad region. So the region of influence that's been recognized by the Department of Energy under pressure by the state of Nevada in the Yucca Mountain licensing proceeding and before it was suspended was a region of influence in terms of accidents, disasters that breach the container and release contents out to 50 miles um, in any direction from these containers. And then for what they refer to as routine shipments but still emitting radiation, um, the region of influence is recognized even by the US uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which admitted this contention for a hearing on the merits of a half mile in any direction from the container. Next slide. Um, legal weight trucks I mentioned, and this is a photo of a, a mock nuclear waste cask that we built in Michigan, or I'm speaking to you from my hometown, Kalamazoo, Michigan. We tried to get as close to the actual size of a truck shipment as possible, uh, legal weight truck shipment container size. It was a bit smaller than the actual thing, but um, we hauled this around the country for a number of years and uh, it's got the call your elected officials action alert on their phone numbers on various panels of this thing. So this was our educational project for a number of years leading up to the big Yucca Mountain boat in 2002. Next slide. So I mentioned barges. Um, this is a, a boat, a ship that's used for transporting nuclear materials, potentially including high level radioactive waste. And the next slide will show one of a number of targeted barge shipment routes, Lake Michigan, as I mentioned, I'm from Southwest Michigan. Palisades in Southwest Michigan would ship up to the port of Muskegon where the waste would then be offloaded onto a train for shipment out West. This is again in the context of Yucca. These are images from the Department of Energy's 2002 final environmental impact statement for Yucca. And then three reactors in Wisconsin would ship south by barge on Lake Michigan into the port of Milwaukee and then offload onto a train for shipment out west. And the reason for this is that if you use rail sized casks, which are gigantic and very heavy, they can't go down interstate highways at highway speeds. You could use what are called heavy haul trucks, but they are um limited to three miles per hour no pressure to go barge shipment route and the truth is the department of energy is looking for the path of least resistance the path of least resistance by the public and they were hoping that barges might be that but senator stabenow um who's about to retire 20 years ago voted against the yucca mountain proposal because of this barge shipment risk on lake michigan next slide And what are those risks? Um, so here's the shipment numbers. The risks are that there's enough fissile material in the waste that if there were to be a sinking, you could actually spark an inadvertent chain reaction inside the container. There's enough uranium-235 um, so there's enough uranium and plutonium-239 in the waste that if a critical mass forms in the sinking disaster and water infiltrates the container, you could spark a chain reaction and it would make emergency response a suicide mission because of the levels of radioactivity being emitted. It was also worsen the releases into the surface water. Next Thank slide. You. Thank you. 
And of course, I mean, I mentioned that Yellowstone River train wreck that is still being dealt with as we speak with hazardous materials on board, like uh, sulfur that can turn to sulfuric acid. So again, what if high level radioactive waste had been on board? And this is another map from Fred Dilger's 2017 study. It shows in red, legal weight truck shipments going down the interstate highways. Um, then even some uh, green heavy haul truck potential. And then the purple is rail shipments. So Illinois, 14 reactors, the most of any state would be very hard hit, not only by its own waste, ironically enough, the vast majority of waste traveling through Illinois bound for Yucca Mountain, Nevada would be coming from other states, but it certainly has a lot of waste of its own as well. Next slide. And this is just a close up of the same map actually, but showing the, uh, the greater Chicago area. But these are just examples. Um, Fred Dilger included 20 major metropolitan areas in that study. There's actually a hundred cities that would be hard hit by Yucca Mountain shipments if it were to ever happen. And um, 44 states plus the District of Columbia under the Yucca plan. And so we're still scrambling to try to get on top of these Texas and New Mexico plans in terms of how many cities, which ones, which states, and the other side, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the companies have tried to keep it as secret as possible. Next slide. And here's the Idaho map from the Dilger 2017. And again, red is legal weight truck shipments, um, purple, a lot of it that is supposed to leave your state by 2035. So that's what's depicted there leaving INL. Next slide. And these, this is a public citizen fact sheet from 20 years ago as we were fighting Yucca Mountain and it shows the in inadequacy of the design criteria. None of these containers have actually been physically tested at full scale. The only testing done is on scale models or computer tests and the design criteria are, are concerned. For test, it's a 1,475 degree fire burning for 30 minutes. Again, inadequate compared to real world accident potentials. There was a train tunnel fire in Baltimore in July of 2001 that burned above 1500 degrees Fahrenheit for a day and then continued to burn at lower temperatures for three days. So you can see the, the disconnect between real world potential and what these containers are designed to withstand. And in fact, a study by the state of Nevada um, looked at what if a Holtec container had been in that fire and they concluded that it would have failed, it would have breached and the casualties uh, were shocking. There were scores of latent cancer fatalities that would have been unavoidable. If people continued to live in contaminated areas for a year, then latent cancer fatalities would grow to 1,500 over time. If people continued to live in contaminated areas for a lifetime, the latent cancer latent cancer fatalities would surmount 30,000. And the cleanup cost to avoid such casualties was nearly $14 billion. This was a 2001 study. So all of that has to be adjusted for inflation. Next slide. Okay, this is a puncture test from just three feet, four inches. So that's almost laughable because bridges are a bit higher than that. Next slide. The next slide should be the underwater submersion. And again, I'm maybe behind what's happening. There it is, okay. We've talked a bit about this, but you can see that the um, three feet of water um, is enough to allow infiltration and the inadvertent criticality also releases into the surface water. But then this other test, 656 feet of water, which is a much greater pressure for one hour, again, begs the question, how are they gonna raise a whole tech UMAX that weighs 180 tons in just one hour's time. There's no requirement, for example, that a crane capable of lifting such weights accompany the barge shipment. They would have to bring in a specialized boat with a crane. It's gonna take more than an hour. So you get the idea that these testing criteria, these design criteria are inadequate compared to real world possibilities. Next slide. So, you know, um, I've really bashed consolidated interim storage. Um, I think for very good reasons, what are our alternatives to it? 
while we advocate um, beyond nuclear and certainly many other groups um, to stop making high level radioactive waste, we should phase out nuclear power. We should abolish nuclear power. We should close the old reactors that already exist. We should not build new ones, including small modular nuclear reactors. Uh, what about the waste that already exists, the 90,000 plus metric tons of commercial waste in this country? Um, hardened on-site storage has been our policy position endorsed by more than 200 groups in all 50 states since 2002. So we're still advocating that for sites where hardened on-site storage is not safe, then as near to the point of generation as possible. And then ultimately, um, hardened on-site storage is an interim measure itself. It can't stay where it's at. It can't stay on the ocean coastlines. It can't stay on riversides. It can't stay on the Great Lakes shorelines. It has to go to a permanent geologic disposal repository someday or some decade or some century. But we've not found one that's safe and secure and sound and socially acceptable. And so Dr. Arjun Makajani of Institute for Energy and Environmental Research and others put out principles for safe management and geological isolation of irradiated nuclear fuel seven years ago now. And it had some basic points like maybe you should have the safety and technical criteria requirements in place before you do the site search. Yucca Mountain, whenever a technical standard could not be met, they simply weakened it or got rid of it. So Dr. Makajani's joke was, the double standard standards of Yucca Mountain, just uh, weaken them or get rid of them. And then I put out something a few years ago called stringent criteria for a highly radioactive waste geologic repository. And you can see what they include. They need to be legal. They need to have consent-based siting from the host communities. They have to be scientifically suitable to protect health and safety, environmental justice, uh, regional equity I mentioned before, no more east dumping on west. Um, limiting transportation risks as much as possible. Um, having the same criteria applied today as 10,000 or 100,000 or a million years from now. Because the Yucca Mountain scam, one of the scams was future generations after 10,000 years were going to be allowed a very significant increase in dose uh, harm. It was, ironically enough, it was a 6.66 fold increase in allowable dose, the number of the beast. So that's not okay. We have to protect future generations as much as current generations. And we also are adamantly opposed to reprocessing, which is the open secret with consolidated interim storage. These private companies like Orano of France, which is the largest reprocessing uh, company in the Western world, once they get the waste in one place, they would love to reprocess it, extract the plutonium, and use it for reactor fuel, or God forbid, um, it could also be used for weapons if in the wrong hands. And I think that's my last slide. All right, thank you. All right, uh, thank you so much for presenting, Kevin. We all really appreciated your present, sorry. Oh, that just sounded like I was repeating words. Appreciated your presentation. Um, so thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, before we start our question period, uh, where can people go to find your work and support you? Well, our website is www.beyondnuclear.org. And that's our new website that's existed for a year. But if you'd like to see the previous 14 years of work, um, including on these issues, uh, please check out our archived website. There's a link at our, our new one. And another really good website, um, I used to work at NEARS, as Ava mentioned earlier. So NEARS has a new website. They also have an archive for the older stuff. Um, there's tremendous uh, postings covering decades of resistance to earlier consolidated interim storage facilities and to the Yucca Dump. And transportation has figured prominently in all of those fights. That's on NEARS.org. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. I will make sure to put that in the chat. Um, all right, so um, I'm just going to jump right in because I've already seen a couple of questions in the chat. Um, first question, Kevin, we got is, uh, can Kevin describe the conditions in which a cask could reach criticality 
the NRC and industry has been making has been telling us it is impossible in a whole tech can. Yeah, so like in an operating reactor core, what you need is a critical mass of uranium-235 and or plutonium-239 fissile material in the presence of neutron moderating water. And so how could this happen um, in transportation? Well, a barge could sink, um, the container could be um, breached in the disaster, water could infiltrate. And during the disaster, a critical mass, there is enough uranium-235 and plutonium-239 still in high-level waste that you could have a critical mass. It could form um, geometrically in the disaster, and water could be the final ingredient. On the bottom of surface water, another version of that would be a truck or train shipment that goes into a surface water, like a bridge crossing over a river or a lake, and it plunges into the, the surface water. And that is the the scenario that just happened in the Yellowstone River with hazardous materials. Another version of this would, let's say, um, Holtex Consolidated Interim Storage Facility. I mentioned there are problems with that subgrade design. One of them is those pits have no drains. And so those pits could flood. And ironically enough, there, there are large um, playa, I'm mispronouncing it, lakes, um, Laguna Gatuna is one of them. It's a large lake when it rains. When it rains a lot, it forms a surface lake. It's immediately adjacent to where Holtec wants to build this consolidated interim storage facility. And there is um, groundwater not very much further down under where they want to build this thing. So there, there's potential for flooding at the Holtec site, um, especially with destabilized climate, extreme weather. Um, at the Texas site, you've got the Oglala Aquifer there. I'm less familiar with the flooding potential at the Texas site, but if uh, if containers um, have water um, and it gets into the uh, the place where the high level waste is, you you're getting closer and closer to inadvertent criticality conditions. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, great reply. Um, we had another question in the chat, or we had two more questions. Um, all of these questions have been from Charles Langley. Um, uh, the next one is, does the 35 is, I'm not sure if it's inches or feet. I'm going to say it's feet because inches is like three feet. <laughs> um, does the 35 foot test, a uh, fall test done with a um, I'm going to rephrase this. Was the 35 foot fall test done with a fully loaded canister, i.e., the weight of the Holtec MPC 37 cans with 37 assemblies is 110,000 pounds total? Yeah, so the 30 foot, it's a 30 foot fall test onto an unyielding surface. There's a second test, it's the puncture test, which is a 40 inch, which is a three foot, four inch fall onto a a spike. That's the puncture test. You know, um, I don't really know if the assumption was, I, I hope the assumption was a fully loaded container because that's what we're talking about here. <laughs> Trying to keep the high level radioactive waste inside these containers, even in accident conditions. Um, I'm hoping that in their scale model testing and in their computer model testing, which is all they've done, that they assumed a fully loaded container because otherwise that would be absurd. So I'm, I'm assuming they did, but I don't know for certain. And they really should. And supposedly though, if these containers have been certified for transportation, like the Holtec UMAX has been, then um, they have to pass these minimalistic design criteria tests. So apparently the NRC, which is not really surprising if you realize how captured they are by the industry, supposedly has run the, the UMAX um, container through these design criteria tests or signed off on the company's own um, testing, which, you know, these are not full-scale physical tests. They've said they were going to do full-scale physical tests in the past, and then they aborted the mission for lack of funding or because they think the public um, would let them get away with it at the time. But so we continue to press for full-scale physical testing, but they, they see it more as a public relations opportunity. Um, rather than a safety requirement. 
Um, I'm going to get through the last question in the chat and then we'll go to Diane. Um, what is what is the argument against SMRs? They're claiming that SMRs are making nuclear waste safer by eliminating the most harmful radioactive elements in a few hundred years. I don't agree. I mean, um, for one thing, uh, there was a study done by Allison McFarlane and Rod Ewing. They were President Obama's Nuclear Regulatory Commission chairman and U.S. Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board chairman just came out several months back. And they reported in their um, study that small modular nuclear reactors due to loss of economy of scale will be generating two to 32 times the amount of radioactive waste per unit of electricity generated as do current um, reactors that exist now. So the quantity is gonna be bad. I'm, you know, I'm dubious of these pie in the sky claims that the waste will magically disappear. Um, I mean, I don't know if they're talking about transmutation here. Um, that would be astronomically expensive. It would be, it's technically unproven at industrial scale. Um, I could go on and on about why these claims are very dubious. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we are going to go to Diane. Hi, thank you, Kevin. Excellent, wonderful summary. Um, I want. I was breaking up. My my own phone was going it uh, going in and out. So you may have said this, but I know that for a while people thought that Yucca Mountain actually had waste at it, and it never has. No waste has ever gone to Yucca Mountain. And when you were describing the proposed CI consolidated interim storage sites in Texas and New Mexico, and you were showing the, the models, the designs, I just wanted to clarify that there's no waste at those sites now, and that those are proposals. And I, I think you said that, but my phone broke out, and so I wasn't sure. And I didn't want, and probably most of the people on this call would know that, but um, that was. Um, you know, just something I wanted to make sure people knew. And then I wanted to ask, um, you talked about the 50 miles from the transport routes that are considered, what did you call it, the zone of something? Um, is that- Region the of influence. So that's the area, if you look at a transport route, then within 50 miles, I don't know if that's 25 each way or 50 each way, but within that area, um, that's an area where radioactivity is measured, could be measured if there was an accident. Maybe elaborate a little on that, if you would. Yep, it's Thanks. actually, um, it's a 50 mile radius in, in each direction from the center line of the container. So it is, it's um, 50 miles to the north, 50 miles to the south. I guess that's a 100 mile diameter. And that's for a breach of the container. And then for the routine shipments, what um, we call mobile x-ray machines that can't be turned off in terms of these allowed um, gamma and neutron emissions, that's a 0 0.5, a half mile in all directions, north, south, um, east, west from the container. Um, so that's the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission admitting um, for hearing on the merits, a state of Nevada contention challenging the standards, the impacts they'll have on people if, if these routine shipments happen, if these breaches of container happen. And the hearing never happened because the licensing proceeding was suspended more than a decade ago, thankfully. But it was a real victory for Nevada um, and for the country because finally, the NRC finally is taking some of this a little bit more seriously. Not that Nevada would have prevailed in the end, but at least there was a spotlight being shined. And that's our challenge is to try to get these um, rogue agencies like the NRC to do their job, which is to protect public health and safety instead of doing the industry's bidding and parroting propaganda. I attended um, a US Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board meeting in Orlando, Florida a couple of months back and the Department of Energy presenters were just awful. And the NRC presenter was just awful. It was just propaganda on transportation risks that they were conveying to the public. And it just was wrong. And I don't 
you know, I'm not saying that the U.S. Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board agrees with the presentations, but they did invite these presenters from these other federal agencies to make these just really bogus presentations in many aspects. So that was that was alarming and made me angry. But thanks, Steve, for clarifying that no waste is in Yucca. No waste hopefully will ever go there. And um, those artist renditions of Holtec and ISP, we hope to keep just that as well. Thank you, so, Catherine. Do you want to? Yeah, hi. It's kind of a, an adjunct to what you're talking about, Kevin. Out here in Washington, we have our legislators and our political groups being hosting and hearing um, the kind of lies you're talking about hearing out of the NRC technical review, the people who are getting invited because the the uh, DOE, um, I think, really does see it as public relations and safety is kind of assumed to already be there, especially when they're talking about this advanced nuclear stuff that they claim is going to be safe. I mean, this uh, Dr. James Kanka, who's been involved with the DOE and the Waste Isolation Pilot Project, said outrageous things to our legislators, and he's got YouTubes out there, and our uh, League of Women Voters had him as a, um, a speaker, and, you know, that people are sucking this up because they so much want to solve the climate crisis with these wonderful small modular reactors that are meltdown safe and walk away safe, and we kind of need something that might be able to counter that in a systematic way. You know, especially I'm thinking about the 13 communities that are going to be identified and targeted for this consent-based um, uh, location. And if we, if there's nobody in those communities to be present at those presentations, they're going to believe these lies. Conca says these ca casks can't break on the rail. They're so safe. They're so, you know, and it's amazing. Um, nobody asks questions. People just take it in and listen. And so I'm not sure, you know, whether maybe um, within NEARS or beyond nuclear or whatever, some way of putting together something that can be um, used to counter it, um, counter the propaganda mm -hmm. in that way. I mean, I know we're here listening and hearing this presentation. We're interested and we believe what we're hearing, but um, we get laughed away as, oh, you're just those scare tactic anti-nuke people. Um, my commissioners at my PUD who are um, advocating a small modular reactor at Hanford, they are putting De uh, James Conca on YouTube um, on Facebook to convey that this is really, you know, it's a political thing. It's not a scientific thing. And the waste is so safe and we've got it all figured out. Um, so uh, I don't know how to respond to that, but um, I would like to see mm -hmm. something, you know, um, portable that can, can be used by people like me in a community where these presentations are happening or with my legislators to say, here mm -hmm. is the other side of this. And it's not even another yeah. side of the truth. Well, um, thanks so much. I'm very sympathetic with how you're feeling. Um, and it's not much different. <laughs> it's very similar to what we've been through for decades on these fights. And a little bit of good news, um, we stopped Yucca Mountain by, by some miracle. And part of that was educating the country about the risks of transportation because it made it everybody's problem. But we were subject to the lies back then by the proponents, the industry, the Department of Energy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the list goes on and on, a university nuclear engineering programs. And so I want to clarify, uh, it's important that the Department of Energy in this rehash of its 1980s, 1990s um, search for an interim site, which back then targeted predominantly Native American reservations, and I think is going to, again, at least to some extent, Right now, these first grants of $2 million each to these 13 different consortia, which involve, I mentioned Holtec, but many universities, I vaguely remember University of Idaho was one of them. Um, I'd have to check that to confirm. Um, three Native American tribes were mentioned. Uh, three Native American affiliated organizations were you know, junior partners and other usual suspects like the American Nuclear Society and the Nuclear Energy Institute. It's a relatively small amount of money. And what it's paying for at this point anyway is promoting this concept. And so my take on that is 
working with all these various players to help sell the lie that consolidated interim storage is a good thing, to help sell the lie that you totally have consent rights, you can just say no. So that that plays into the targeting of communities that would be vulnerable to saying yes, like Native American reservations that are low income in many cases and regarded as wastelands by the dominant society in the first place, that kind of thing. So the challenge is to really, there's so much propaganda. There's a joke, it's not really a joke, it was serious. In Nevada, there was a phrase, spinning the splitting of the atom. Like, yeah, they make electricity, yeah, they make bombs, but you know what they do? They make a lot of propaganda because they wanna make a lot of money. And so they they enter into a lot of deception. With James Conk, uh, you kind of named it, he's worked in the industry for a long time. There's that quote from Upton Sinclair that was in Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. That's where I first heard it. It's difficult to get somebody to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. So, you know, take the waste isolation pilot plan that James Conk has been involved with for so long and has said, oh, it's safe. Nothing could possibly go wrong. They had an impossible leak into the environment. What was claimed to be impossible in 10,000 years, or maybe it was 200,000 years, they had it on Valentine's Day of 2014 when a barrel or multiple barrels burst in the whip underground and the plutonium and other transuranic contaminants traveled thousands of feet in the underground, thousands of feet up through the ventilation shaft, and then blew God knows where in the surface environment, exposing a couple dozen workers at the surface to plutonium inhalation doses, an impossible accident. And, and Conta told, said it was impossible. He told, our but, he told our legislators that that was a minor radioactive radio radiation leak. And you know, um, it, unbelievable his how, how well, it shot the dump. It shot the dump for three solid years. I believe it cost three billion dollars yes. to recover yes. from. They had to close whole sections of the WIP facility. Yeah. Can't be used. Too dangerous for workers to be in. Now workers going down in there have to wear full protective gear, including respirators. Didn't used to be the case. They were very fortunate that that underground wasn't filled with workers that day because several days earlier they'd had an industrial mine fire, a vehicle caught fire in the whip underground, sent again, a couple dozen people to the emergency room, one with permanent damage to his lungs, was a serious underground fire. It led to the evacuation of workers from the underground, which was still in effect when the barrel burst took place. Except for that lucky timing, that whip underground could have been full of a full force of workers without respiratory protection on, getting a concentrated plutonium dose in the whip underground. Sheer luck that that didn't happen. And another aspect of that whole incident is, you know what? They had to ship those that barrel or those barrels that burst in the whip underground from Los Alamos down to whip. Thank God the, the barrel didn't burst during transportation. What would have happened then? And then to get their bonus, the subcontractor sent the potentially bursting barrels that were still at the surface down to waste control specialists where they baked in the summer sun for several years. Thankfully, another barrel didn't burst at the surface at waste control specialists. So dodging all these bullets, it's, uh, it's not huh, the safety culture. There is none. I mean, they have other, other motivations. But I hear you um, rebutting the propaganda of the nuclear industry is a full-time job for armies of people. So. We do our best and these on here will continue to do our best to get materials out and speak truth to power and show up at these countless meetings and try to rebut the other side. That's why I said that that eight hour day in Orlando was pretty painful listening to eight hours of lies and then getting a little bit of time at the end. I think I got eight minutes and D was um, there by computer. <laughs> How do you rebut eight hours of lies in eight minutes? That's kind of the David versus Goliath nature of our challenge. Could I also um, respond to Catherine? Yeah, go ahead, Anne. Um, uh, part of your question was, how do we help the 13 communities that um, responded to the Department of Energy consent-based siting. The reality is that not one community 
uh, that we know of. Not, not one community was granted money um, on consent-based program. All of these, as Kevin said, were our um, universities, nuclear companies like Deep Isolation and Holtec and uh, the Nuclear Energy Institute and uh, mostly uh, some pro-nuclear organizations, one more objective one out of Massachusetts, but it, there's not one community that would consider being um, a, a centralized interim storage site. And so just, that, that's just, you know, that was what they wanted supposedly when they first started was to help volunteer communities or communities that would consider volunteering and they didn't get any. So now they've created these consortia of organizations and, and industry and um, universities that are going to, I think, be like the PR front uh, promoting consolidated storage or providing information, hopefully not too bad of misinformation, but it's DOE funded. So I'm, right. and on the low level waste fight back in the um, 80s and 90s, um, the universities in Ohio got a grant, a DOE grant to do public education. And they had all kinds of misinformation on the level way. So this was DOE funded universities, then with all their credibility. So I think we're going to be up against, um, you know, the DOE's got its its um, front. It's put the universities out front in its fight for a dump, and it's having them do the the dirty work of trying to educate the public or miseducate the public. And of course, another sickening aspect of that is the DOE is using federal taxpayer money to do all this on behalf of the industry. The industry's got a lot of money from taxpayers and from state taxpayers and ratepayers to work with as well. And that, you know, miseducation from DOE extends not just to the university level, but even down to high schools, junior highs, elementary schools. They've engaged in, you know, trying to uh, influence young minds industry too. So it's a real challenge. But, you know, I mentioned the Yucca Mountain victory, but we've also stopped consolidated interim storage facilities like um, private fuel storage limited at Skull Valley Go Shoots Indian Reservation in Utah a decade or 15 years ago. It already had a license from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so even though the Texas dump and the New Mexico dump have gotten their licenses from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Skull Valley shows we can still stop them, and uh, we have to. Wonderful, Kevin. Thank you. Um, well, it's 7.15, and it's time to wrap up unless there are any last-minute questions. Um, and I think Ava's going to take us out. Just real quick, I did see a question in the chat box about a scenario for a terrorist disaster, but, and, and you did mention an anti-tank weapon. That is certainly a real possibility. Um, there are weapons, shaped charges, um, high explosives, uh, anti-tank weapons that could destroy these containers. These containers were not designed to withstand attack like that. Those weapon systems are designed to penetrate very thick tank armor, armored military vehicles. And yeah, these containers are robust. The question is, are they robust enough and I think there's real questions about their survivability when attacked by certain weapon systems. And again, Nevada, to its credit, has done cutting edge scholarship on these very questions of the security risks alone of large scale high level waste shipping. Are there links available for your first two um, uh, lectures, Kevin, that we can get anywhere? Oh. Those were Snake River Alliance's first two other oh, okay. other presenters. Okay. Um, so Catherine, I just responded to you in the chat with our YouTube page. Um, and our page has both of our Thank previous you. lectures. Thank you. Um, okay. If there's nothing else, um, I just wanted to extend a big thank you to Kevin for your time and expertise. Uh, I would also like to thank all of you for your interest and for joining us this evening.
It's important that we learn more and make responsible moral energy choices. To learn more and support Kevin's work, you can visit beyondnuclear.org. And I also put that link in the chat. Uh, if you would like to support these lectures and learn more about the Snake River Alliance, please visit snakeriveralliance.org. There, you can join the mailing list to receive an invitation to the next lecture in the Nuclear Fuel Chain series. 